So if you're just tuning in for the first time and you're here with us, and man, we're so excited that you're here. We are actually going to be covering today who the real enemy of relationship is. Uh, week number one, we covered keeping relationships Christ-centered and why that was important. Last week, we talked about keeping relationships mission-driven, protected by unity. And this week, we're going to talk about the real enemy of our souls and how to create devil-kicking relationships. How many of you want a devil-kicking relationship? I know I do, right? Hands are going up, of course. Because the real enemy of our souls is the devil. But before we jump into that, I do have a little bit of a caution for you guys today. This message is about relationships in your life that you want to keep. These are healthy relationships. These are spouse relationships, child relationships, work relationships, church relationships. We are not talking about toxic relationships. We are not talking today about relationships that have hurt you. We're not talking about abusive relationships or cheating relationships. We actually did a series for those relationships back in August called Toxic Relationships. So please go back and listen to that. Again, this message is for you and in the relationships that you desire to keep in your life. So when we look at conflict in relationships, we have to look at sources, right? So when I have conflict in the relationships God placed in my life, the problem is me sometimes, right? The problem is you sometimes. The problem is us. And sometimes the problem is definitely spiritual. And we see this first spiritual problem show up in the Garden of Eden. Actually, we could take a step before that. We actually saw the first church split, the first relationship split actually happened in heaven, right? When Lucifer, who was an angel of the Lord in charge of worship, was cast down out of heaven because of his sin. He had a pride issue. He was unrepentant and he wanted to be God, right? So he was... uh, uh, kicked out of heaven, if you will, thrown down to the earth and took a whole lot of angels with him because of his ability to deceive. He is the master manipulator of deception. Then here he is thrown down to the earth, right? And there's this garden and Adam and Eve live in a relationship with God, a perfect relationship, one in which there was no sin, there was no separation. And the angel manipulated Eve, right? What does Scripture tell us? That he caused the woman and the man to question the goodness of God, to question God's favor in their life, to question God's love. And what that happened, what happened was this, is that that questioning created a gap in the relationship. Up until that point, Adam and Eve had zero gaps in the relationship. You know what a gap is? It's when someone says they're going to do something, then they don't do it. And you and I are left standing there wondering why. Or your husband or your wife says, oh, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to cook dinner. I'll get the laundry done. And when you get home, it's not done. And we wonder why. So there's a gap in a relationship. The enemy caused a gap to be placed in the relationship between man and God. And you know what happens when there's a gap? Sadly, we never fill it with anything positive. And Eve filled it with speculation. God is holding back from me. God doesn't love me. God is not as good as I thought he was. And all of a sudden, a new narrative was written. Okay, a new narrative that was uh, different than truth, that was separate than truth. And that lie brought in death because when we live under lies, we've been manipulated by the enemy. And this is what Scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age... Now notice it's a lowercase, so it doesn't mean our God, but the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So here we see that the first attack the enemy makes on all relationships is you and God. The first attack on relationships is our ability to see, to know, to love God, to experience the goodness of God in relationships, and He will not spare God-given relationships in our lives. How many of you know when God wants to bless you, He brings relationships into your lives? The enemy of your soul wants to tarnish all of those relationships because he hates God, he hates what God is doing, and he hates you, and he hates me, and he deceives us. And deception brings death when we live under it. But here's the good news. How many of you know that your Savior is a total dragon slayer? Total dragon slayer. You have a Savior who died for your sins and mine. The enemy is completely defeated by Christ's work on the cross. If you're a follower of Jesus, let me make this very clear. The only influence the enemy has on your life is temptation. 
It's up to you and I to say whether we open that door or not to let him in. The only thing he can do is manipulate the narratives or the things we believe to be true. He cannot harm you in any other way because Jesus' uh, work on the cross had victory over death, which was brought in by sin, and victory over sin. The enemy is completely defeated. Your Savior is a total dragon slayer. In today's message, we're going to talk about two objectives. One, how does the enemy gain access to our relationships? How does he gain access? Number two, how you can evict him out of your life. He's a horrible squatter in your life that's not paying you or I rent. Let's understand that. He's not somebody you want in your life. And as I was thinking about this message, man, the Lord brought to me a really great case study. We are actually seeing a case study happening in our lifetime that is representative to me, uh, the work of the enemy in your life and my life. And without being political, I'm going to venture to say, look, let's look at North Korea together. Think about this. North Korea is a dictatorship, right? And it's been a closed country. And what they teach children at a young age is that they are at war with America. How many of you have grown up thinking you're at war with North Korea? No, it's kind of a cold war. It's silent. Like we don't desire to go in there to hurt them, to do anything of the sort. But these kids at a very young age, man, they're, they're really given a counterfeit of history to some, to some level here. And what they're told is that America is eventually going to come in and you and I, the sons of America, are going to do damage to these wonderful, little, beautiful Korean, North Korean children. And they're shown pictures that are cartoons of, of American soldiers stabbing with bayonet children in North Korea. Like, this is what they're taught. They're literally victims being brainwashed. And while you and I are sitting here pledging allegiance to the flag, our country, and to God, in North Korea, they pledge allegiance to the leader who, believe it or not, you guys can Google this, I'm not making it, making it up, he has his own Ten Commandments that they are to memorize, that they are to know. And then, they, not only are they gearing up for war, but they sing worship songs, just like we did to God this morning. They literally sing it to their leader. They're brainwashed. They're on the wrong side of history and they don't even know it. In third grade, you know what they do in third grade? They, they dress up dummies in the uh, outfits of American soldiers and kids are made to stab these dummies. Like they're brainwashed. And, and as I unpack this, I'm like, holy smokes, that's what the enemy does in our lives. You see, he manipulates the truth in your life regarding you and God. Like we can't even connect with God, right? Unless God breaks the barrier, which he's done on the cross, because the enemy's desire is to brainwash us to question the goodness, the faithfulness, the character of God. And then in relationships, God brings you these wonderful children. God brings you these wonderful spouses that we've prayed for. And then we get frustrated with them because at times they, they create gaps in relationships and it's not them who fills the gap, it's you and I. And why is it never anything positive? Why don't we ever fill the gap with, oh, they were busy or, oh, you know, they love me and they didn't mean what they said, right? We always fill it with a negative narrative. And for me, I'll be honest with you guys, I have struggled with this on some level or another my whole life. The reality is the enemy is the instigator of your relationships. He's the instigator of every good, godly relationship in your life. He's an instigator in your marriage. He's an instigator with your teenagers. He's an instigator with your neighbors. And with, you know, over holidays that are coming up, he's an instigator in your families. So for me, though, I've struggled all my life with anxiety and worry. Who in here knows anxiety? Raise your hand. All right, wow. You guys are just like me. I feel like I'm home, okay? So you're all a bunch of worry warts just like me. I don't judge you. Man, all my life I struggled, and I would say I really haven't had victory up until about the last decade of my life. I always wanted everybody to be happy. I always wanted conflict to be kept to a minimum. Man, I always wanted to make sure that I was understood. One of my greatest fears is not how people judge me, but that they misunderstood what I think, what I said, or what I meant in my behavior. And it created lots of worrisome behavior on my part. So then what I would do as a younger man, I would fill the gaps. If I called somebody a couple times and they didn't pick up, what was the first thought I had? Did I say something wrong? Did I offend them? Do they not like me anymore? Or today, this is years ago, right? Today, if somebody leaves you on read, what do you conclude? Like you read that seven hours ago and still didn't respond. Like I could see the time that you read that. And, and there's a gap created. And we fill that gap with all sorts of things. And then we think, well, they're rude. Like, no, they're maybe at work. Maybe they can't answer their phone, right? So we, we, we fill the gap oftentimes with 
all sorts of negativity. And then the heart starts to shift a little bit. And then we start to think gossipy things. But we have to realize a couple things. Gaps are created when someone isn't consistent in your life. When someone says they're going to do something and they don't, and they fail to do that, a gap is created. Man, when they do the opposite of an expectation, another gap is created. Or the opposite of an agreement. The reality is, you and I struggle because our perspectives sometimes are geared toward the negative. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Like really take a moment and take stock of your relationships and either, even your relationships with God. When you get that new car, when that miracle check comes in the mail, when you get that job you've been praying for, or that amazing spouse that you've been asking God for, they come. Man, you're like, man, God is good. And then you have trouble eventually paying the bills. Your relationships are struggling. And then we start to question the goodness of God because a gap was created. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12 is, uh, tells us we can do some things. Number uh, Verse 11. Put on the full armor of God so that you could take your stand against the devil's schemes. Right? Schemes. Again, what is his ability in your life? It's not to attack you physically. There's no like spooky stuff going on if you're a child of God. It's just your mind, right? So it's his schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. You guys were fighting the wrong people. Your enemy is not the person sitting next to you. Look at your spouse and say, it's not you, honey. Right? It's not you. That's not your enemy. Your enemy is a far different person. So what does Scripture say our enemy is? Our enemy is this, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Your enemy is the devil, make no mistake about it. You know what people are? Most people in your life are not evil. Most people in your life don't intend evil. They're broken people just like you and I who are far from perfect. If we're perfect at anything, it's being imperfect. And that's the reality. We're going to fail each other. We're going to let each other down. But what you do with those gaps is solely up to you. And it's going to in, uh, influence the outcome of your relationships and mine. But when we give ourselves over to the negativity, the devil has a way of souring a really sweet relationship. Man, this happens. We see this very easily with children. Man, I was a superhero until my kids were 10 years old. A stinking superhero. And then they became teenagers. How many got teenagers? Y'all know my pain. Right? We're going to have a, a group therapy after, after church today, and we're going to talk. Um, yeah, but something happens, right? And then teenagers start to feel like you're against them. And you're like, we gave birth to you. I, I've simply asked you don't hang out with the wrong kids. Right? I simply ask you, don't do drugs and alcohol. I want you home at a certain hour. Like The things I'm asking you, they're kind of good for you, but somehow we become the bad guy because a gap in the relationship was created. The moment we say no, the moment God says no to you, the moment a loved one in your life puts up a boundary in your life and says, I can't, all of a sudden we get offended because a gap was created and we fill that. So let's play a little game. We're going to call it the gap game. Number one, when your kids tell you that, they'll finish, that they finished their homework only for you to find they did not, what do you fill that gap with? Think about that. When your kids tell you they did their homework and you find out they actually didn't, what do you fill it with? Number two, your spouse told you they paid the bills only for you to get a call a week later from a creditor. What do you fill that gap with? What do you fill it with? Guys, you can follow, you're all laughing because you know, right? You're all in there. Listen, the reality is they probably forgot probably, and your kids probably are getting over you. No, I'm joking. Maybe they had a good reason, okay? The dog ate the homework, all right? So number three, your friend leaves you on red. They leave you on red. I'm going to tell you this right now. If you're left on red between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., stop overreacting. They're probably at work. Now, after that, maybe we can like freak out a little bit, right? But what do we fill that gap with? I'm left on red. Number four, they don't call you back when you think they should. Why are they not calling me back? Why are they ignoring me? Why don't they want to talk to me? Where are you? What have I done? Right? We start asking those questions. Number five. This is the worst one. When I call or send a card or a little hand wave on Facebook or Instagram and I don't get nothing back. Like, what's up with that? We get offended and we fill the gaps. And this is what happens when we fill the gaps. We actually create a new narrative and that's where the enemy's hand is. 
Look, we're going to get offended. Jesus himself said, you can't go through this life without offense, okay? So if you think you're special, you are. You're special to God, but you're still going to get offended. You're going to get offended by God. You're going to get offended by people because nobody acts the way we think they should when we think they should. Nobody does what we want them to do. And, and we even apply that to God. So when a new narrative is built, watch me on this, follow this, okay? We create a new narrative. Now the story we've created is far from truth. Now we're starting to get a little figurative here, right? We're starting to, to create things in the story that weren't there. Then something happens with your heart and my heart. Man, we see this in Scripture. When a heart is turned from someone in a relationship, even from God, it is harder to gain back than to overtake a fortified city, Scripture show, uh, tells us. Think about that. Once your heart turns, once somebody's heart is turned away from you, it is almost impossible to get it back. And then what we have in our relationships, we no longer see the person as they really are, but as our speculation has created them to be. And that's where we're at. And we're fighting the wrong people. But I would assert to you guys that the enemy's access to your relationships happens in the gap. That's where the enemy's hand is. It's in the, it's in the gap. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22-26, to 26, man, is a really uh, model for us on exactly how the enemy gets access. Why don't you guys read on with me? Flee uh, the evil desires, which is sin, of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So what Scripture is telling us here is, do not give the enemy a foothold in your life. You can only pursue peace when in relationships with others. You can only pursue love when in relationships with others. What Scripture is telling us to do here is give the benefit of the doubt. Stop speculating in relationships. Choose peace with people who are not perfect. And imagine if they chose peace with you. What would happen in your relationships and mine? They would be absolutely transformed and the enemy would not have an open door. But Scripture goes on, verse 23. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. When you think bad things about people, it comes out in our behavior. And then we suck our teeth, we roll our eyes. I used to tell one of my kids that she must really know what, the, what her frontal lobe looks like because she always looked up whenever I talked to her. Like, seriously, I was like, how's that gray matter going up there? Like, man, I'm sorry, I love you, right? But I was so misunderstood in these relationships. And, and, and then when we start thinking bad things about our spouse and our kids, it sows a seed of death in your marriage. It sows a seed of death with you and your children. It sows a seed of death with you and your friends simply because you're gossiping about them in your own mind. You see, you and I think gossip is always with the tongue, but there are two tongues in your life. There's the one in your mouth, which is a snake, I promise you, and, and my own. And then there's the one in your head, which intends to do you harm. Because there's things I think that I thank God none of you know. I'm embarrassed sometimes that God sees it. But the reality is, this is the seed or the foundation where those negative things we say, this is where it comes from. This is where relationships get cursed. It starts with the new narrative of manipulation of the enemy in your life and mine. Verse 24 and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Scripture's telling us to turn our heart away from filling the gaps in our relationships with negativity, but to turn our hearts toward good things. Give people in your life, your spouse, your kids, your friends, give them the benefit of the doubt. That doesn't mean excuse bad behavior. Let's understand that. What we're talking about is recognize who you're dealing with wonderfully broken people just like you and I. The same grace God extends to you in your life is the same grace that God is asking you and I to extend to somebody else. Do they deserve it? No. They don't deserve your grace. They don't deserve your forgiveness. And that's the beauty of grace. Because you and I don't deserve God's. That's the good news of the Gospel. That you can have what you don't deserve, what you couldn't buy, what you couldn't afford, with your own money that you can't accomplish on your own. God freely gives it to you because relationship is more important than conflict and gossip and frustration. God created you and me for relationship. That is a devil-kicking relationship. Let's go on to verse 25. So what then when we're dealing with difficult people? What then when we're, when we're dealing with people who we would consider opponents? This is what Scripture said. Opponents must be gently instruct, instructed in the hope that God will grant repentance leading them to the knowledge of the truth that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, which is the way we think, 
who has taken them captive to do His will. Like when we think about doing the will of the enemy, we think like warlocks and witches and really bad people doing spells. That's not what Scripture shows us. The will is destruction. It's being willing to have destructive relationships. To hurt people. What are the greatest two commandments Jesus taught us, right? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your might, all your soul, and to love your neighbor less than yourself. No. Don't say yes. To love your neighbor like yourself. Like yourself. The reality is, God is saying love people and have unity. The enemy is saying judge them harshly. Now let's slow down here. So we understand a couple things, right? We understand that troublesome relationships come when we fill the gaps. That's how how we allow the enemy of your soul and my soul to have access to relationships. But it, you got to understand, once that access happens, we're going to go back to the heart. Your heart shifts and turns. And there are a number of reasons why relationship fails. Uh, we're going to look at this real quick, a couple pictures, uh, if you guys would follow along here, of some of the more common reasons why marriages and dating relationships fail. Number one is money. Right? How many of you feel like that? If your spouse is still with you, it's because they really love you. But some of us, what we love is comfort over the heart, over relationship. Number two is expectations. Right, as we look at that, right, expectation is that we're going to have this loving, committed relationship, and then you marry this guy. (laughs) Sorry, honey, I know you're in here somewhere, and you marry that guy. And then some of you even go further, and you say, you know what, I'm done with people. I don't like people. People let me down. I love animals. So then you go out and you buy a dog, and this is what you get. Right? That's your expectation, and that's your reality. Who sleeps with a dog? Some of us do. I know I got hands. I see a couple hands, right? You get a paw in your face. Just like my wife, she hates my cold feet at night. It could be 2 o'clock in the morning, and if my foot touches her, I hear, your foot's touching me, take it off, right? I'm like, 20 years of marriage, and she hates my feet. The next is fighting. This one's not funny. The reality is, right, we're fighting the wrong people, but when you put two imperfect people together, this is what you get. You get a power struggle. Always a power struggle. The next one, believe it or not, relationships end because of weight gain. Oh, no, not that one. There you go. And y'all know my wife loves me because she's stuck by my side, right? After all these years. The next reason why relationships failed marriages is intimacy issues. Think about that. Intimacy issues, right? That the reality is many marriage marriages fail because people's hearts turn and they're not interested in each other anymore. The last two are far from funny. Infidelity and abuse. Far from funny. So again, this message is really about relationships that we want to stay in, relationships that are healthy, relationships that God called us to. But I need to share with you guys, man, and go back to toxic relationships, which was preached back in August. If you're in a relationship where you're with a chronic cheater, or you're in an abusive relationship, some relationships are better left. You you need to understand that. God didn't create you to be a doormat. God did not create you um, to be hurt. God did not create you to be devalued. And we're not talking just about hurt feelings. I'm talking about somebody who intends evil in your life. Most people don't intend evil. The reality is 99.9% of everybody you meet in this life are just broken people, just like you and I. But there are some people in life that seriously intend harm. And if that person's in your life, you need to meet with a counselor. You need to connect with us at the church and talk to me as a pastor. We want to come alongside you guys and work through those things. But if that's the type of relationship you're in, go back to toxic relationships and definitely set up an appointment with somebody. But th- that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about showing grace. And then you guys ask the question, right? So pastor, now we know how the enemy gains access. How do we evict the enemy? And we're going to look at the James chapter 4, verse 1 to 12. We're actually going to jump over a couple scriptures here. But verse 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Paul's asking questions here and making points. What he's saying to us is, one way you can evict the devil out of your life is test your heart. Test your motives. Judge rightly what's happening inside of you. Ask the Holy Spirit in. Some of us came in here today and we feel like there's a veil between us and God. Man, if that's you, Jesus is a dragon slayer of your life. He will tear that down. What you need to do in boldness God, help me. Jesus, reveal yourself to me. And then when it comes to this point, Holy Spirit, reveal to me what's wrong. I love the psalmist's heart. He said, God, forgive me for the sins that I'm aware of and also forgive me for the sins that I have long forgotten. You know what that means? It means be humble. 
It means to recognize we're not perfect. It means whatever relationships you're in with you, your kids, you, your spouse, you, your friends, your colleagues at work, your church family, model humility. We're broken people. And that's what Paul's telling us to do here. What does this conflict teach me about myself? God, give me the guts to judge myself. Not so that I can judge myself harshly, but that I can see what's wrong in me and I can surrender it to your cross. Because you don't have to feel bad about yourself if you're a child of God. Many of us feel bad about ourselves already. The reality is this. Jesus fully and completely paid your price. He's going to forgive you. Let's jump to verse number 7. Submit yourselves uh, then to God. Resist the devil and flee. Uh, flee from sin is really what he's saying. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Number 2. Scripture's telling us to repent. Search my heart, O oh God. Make it new. Search my heart, O oh God. Show me what's sin in me. And number two, God, I repent of those things you've shown. And number three, let's go on to verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Right? Talk about the head and fill in the gaps. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judge them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver, one judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So what God's saying here is submit. There are three things we need to learn from this. One, know the motives of your heart. Number two, repent and stop judging the person next to you. We're only going to do relationships in this life right when we invite Jesus in first. All good and healthy relationships come from the number one that was tarnished from the beginning. Man's relationship with God, that was made possible for you by the cross. Then we receive Jesus in our lives. We believe in Jesus. We, we repent from sin. We turn toward God and then our heart shifts. Right? The heart can turn the other way too. And all of a sudden, Scripture tells us that we are to be Christ-like. And as the Holy Spirit works deep in your life, you start to want to express the things God has expressed to you and me. Why do I want to forgive others? Because I was forgiven. Why do I want to serve? Because Jesus served me. Why do I want to love? Because I was loved. Why do I want to save? Because I was saved. What is God speaking in your life? Every one of us right now can think of that relationship of conflict with our kids, our loved ones, our family. Every one of us know, knows what it means to be in absolute turmoil in relationships. And maybe God is calling you to ask for strength to endure it. Maybe God is calling you to ask for faith to work through it. Maybe you need to say, God, give me the strength I naturally don't have to extend grace and mercy because that's the beauty about grace. You didn't earn it either. God freely and completely gives to you and I that which we didn't deserve. Who are we to keep it from my wife or my kids or my neighbor or people in church? Who am I to judge you when God has shown you graciousness and kindness and God has shown me patience in my own sin? Who am I to resist patience in your life? What, because as my, maybe you're sitting there and you're married and you're like, well, my husband doesn't come to church. Oh, my wife doesn't come to church. How long was God patient with you? How long did it take you to come to church? And never did God squash you. Never did He make you feel bad about who you are as a person. What He did was He wooed you with love. He wooed you with love. And if we take anything out of this message today, man, we now know how to keep the enemy from our relationships. We know that. We now know how to evict him out of our relationships. But that leads us to another action. Jesus, give me the guts to love as you love. Maybe you're in here today and you don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe you walked in here today and you're far from God and you're like, man, that all sounds so great and dandy. I wish I could do that. But I feel guilty in my life. I feel far from God. I've done things, Pastor, you don't even know what I've done that are unforgivable or unspeakable. Man, I want to tell you some good news. You're not too great for God. You're not, your sins aren't too big for God. He died for those. He paid for those. If you would just say, Jesus, I want to be your friend. I mean, it's really this simple, guys. Jesus, I acknowledge my sins. Forgive me for my sins. I want to surrender my life to you. If you do that, the Bible says you're saved. The Bible says you have no more of a negative past. You're a new creation in Christ. You can make your relationships new through surrender.